I'd ask for adoption of the bill and reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Uh, the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and the County of Carleton, Minnesota have proposed a land exchange involving 1,451 acres of tribal fee land located outside the band's reservation. These lands would be exchanged for tax forfeited state lands of equivalent value that are administered by, the Carleton, uh, administered by Carleton County but located within the band's reservation. H.R. 2650 would authorize the land exchange and would allow future land exchanges between the county and the band, which has been identified as candidates for similar land exchanges. We support H.R. 2650, urge its passage by the House today. Representative Nolan is to be commended for his leadership and persistence on behalf of his constituents and, and his district. And I reserve the balance of our time. Gentlemen reserves. The gentleman from California continue to reserve. And I have no further speakers. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield as much time as he may, he may consume to the gentleman from Minnesota, the sponsor of the legislation, uh, Mr. Nolan. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, thank you to my uh, distinguished colleague, Congressman Gravela, for uh, his leadership on the committee and his management of, of this bill here in particular. And thanks to all those who have work together in a bipartisan manner uh, to bring this important legislation to the floor of the House here today. In particular, I want to thank Natural Resource Committee Chairman Doc Hastings, former ranking member and now United States Senator Ed Markey, and current ranking member uh, Peter DeFazio, as well as my uh, old friend, Chairman Don Young, Chairman of the Natural Resources Subcommittee on Indian and Alaska Native Affairs, and ranking member uh, Colleen Hanabusa and, of course, Senator Al Franken of Minnesota, who shepherded the can companion bill uh, in the Senate. I also want to thank Karen Diver, the chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band, and her colleagues on the Reservation uh, Business Committee, as well as their Natural Resources Management Team, Reggie Defoe, Steve Olson, and Jack Bissett. And finally, a thank you to uh, Gregory Bernou, the Carleton County Land Commissioner, and the entire uh, Carleton County Board of Commissioners and their staff for their diligence and good faith in negotiating the agreement. We are prepared to ratify here today, and of course, last, last but not least, my legislative staff assistant, Will Mitchell. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this bill, H.R. Uh, 2650, provides the legally required approval uh, by the Congress for an exchange of land between the Fond du Lac Band and the Carleton County in my 8th Congressional District of Minnesota. By way of, of brief, brief background, uh, federal land allotment policies in the early 20th century played havoc with an 1854 treaty that set aside 101,000 acres of reservation land exclusively for the Fond du Lac ban. I would like to point out to my colleagues that as they enter the chamber over here from the west front, there's a bust of, of Chief Buffalo, the uh, great uh, Chippewa chief from the Minnesota uh, 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 territory, who negotiated this treaty in 1854. And uh, he and uh, fellow band members uh, got in a canoe. And they canoed, uh, starting in Lake Superior, all the way through the Great Lakes, out to New York City, and then took a train uh, from there down to Washington to negotiate this treaty. And then, of course, took a train back to New York and, uh, and canoed all the way back through the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Great Lakes. And, uh, and, and back to the, the Chippewa Nation in, in the Minnesota Territory. And as I enter this chamber myself each day, I'm reminded uh, sometimes of the long, hard travel uh, that's required to do the right thing uh, representing uh, our people, as I know all the members of this Congress are, are committed to doing. So each day when I enter this chamber, I, I say hi to Buffalo, and I recommend that uh, each of you uh, do the same. And I'm not sure, but when I walked by him today, I, I thought I saw a, a, a pleasant look of approval, if not a little nod, that the Congress was uh, going to work here today to take care of this legislation. 
Because unfortunately, after that treaty was negotiated, homesteaders and others were wrongly permitted to settle on this tribal land, and much of which was later forfeited uh, to the county for non-payment of taxes. The result today is a checkerboard of ownership that significantly limits both the Fond du Lac Band and the county's ability to effectively uh, use these lands uh, that they control. Under this agreement, which meets all the requirements of Minnesota law, the Fond du Lac uh, Band uh, will transfer 1,451 acres of land they own outside the Fond du Lac Reservation to Carleton County. In return, Carleton County will transfer approximately 3,200 acres of land of equal value, I, I might, must point out, that they now administer within the boundaries of the Fond du Lac Reservation back to the Fond du Lac Band. It's a sensible agreement that provides space for the band to construct much needed housing for its 6,700 members, as well as provide more area for hunting, gathering, and um, native activities. Additionally, the agreement provides uh, Carleton County with valuable uh, new timber and forestry resources. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, I would point out that HR 2650 is modeled on statutes that were passed in this body in 2000 and 2004, allowing the Lower Sioux Indian community in Minnesota and the Shakopee Mittawakan Sioux community in Minnesota to accomplish similar transactions. It is also my understanding that passage of this bill will greatly help facilitate possible similar transactions between the Fond du Lac Band and Carleton County in the future. Mr. Speaker, I respectfully ask my colleagues to approve this legislation. And again, thank you to all those uh, who have worked on this uh, for their work in this uh, bipartisan effort uh, to uh, pass this legislation. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman from Arizona reserve? Yield back the balance of our time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Arizona yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'd urge adoption of the legislation and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 2650 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, proceedings will resume on motions to suspend the rules previously postponed. Votes will be taken in the following order. H.R. 255, H.R. 2719, H.R. 1204. All by the yeas and nays. The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15-minute vote. Remaining electronic votes will be conducted as five-minute votes. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 255, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 255, a bill to amend certain definitions contained in the Provo River Project Transfer Act for purposes of clarifying certain property descriptions and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote. The House made quick work of 10 bills this afternoon. They're voting here on three of them, this one dealing with a water project on the Provo River in central Utah. By a voice vote earlier today, they passed firearms legislation, legislation to extend a ban on the manufacturer sale of of plastic or other non-metal firearms that can evade detection that uh, passed by a voice vote. The Hill writes that our original law was passed in 1988. It's been re renewed twice since then, and without today's reauthorization, the law would have expired next week on December the 9th. House also approved a bill that would direct the TSA to transfer unclaimed money that they recover at airport security checkpoints to uh, nonprofit organizations which operate airport centers providing arrests for military members and their families. That was by a voice vote as well. CQ says that current law directs unclaimed money collected at airport security checkpoints to be used for civil aviation security. And this would uh, provide it for the United Services Organization, the USO, a congressionally chartered 
nonprofit organization. That passed uh, earlier today. Also earlier today, both the Democratic Caucus and the House Republican Conference met this morning ahead of the uh, morning hour session in the House. After that, Republican leaders came out to uh, speak to reporters on a number of issues, including a question about the farm bill and Leader Boehner saying that, quote, we can't get Senate Democrats to say yes. Here's their news conference from earlier today. Hello, everybody. Everybody. Morning, everybody. Our Republicans continue uh, to stay focused on the economy, and the fact is that the American people want us to do everything we can to strengthen the economy so there'll be more jobs and higher wages available. This week, we'll take uh, further steps uh, to strengthen our economy. President health care law continues to wreak havoc on American families, uh, small businesses, and our economy. And it's not just a broken website. This bill is fundamentally flawed, uh, causing people uh, to lose uh, the doctor of their choice, causing them to lose their health plan, and if that isn't enough, uh, they're having to pay much higher prices at the same time. So House Republicans are going to continue to listen uh, to our constituents, listen to the American people, and try to focus on protecting them from a fundamentally flawed law. Good morning. Um, last week, as working middle class families across the country tried to prepare for Thanksgiving, uh, the Obama administration tried to hide another unilateral one year delay of Obamacare. Just like in July, right, after, right before the Independence Day holiday, the administration tried to hide the one year delay of the business mandate. President Obama and others have tried to hide what they knew about the website problems well before the website launch. The administration tries to continue to hide problems on the back end of the website that deliver information and payments to insurers, often as we now know incorrectly. The administration has tried to hide the security problems that exist uh, with the website that one official called limitless prior to the website's launch. The President and House Democrats tried to hide for years that millions of Americans would lose the coverage uh, that they liked. The President and House Democrat, Democrats tried to hide for years uh, that many Americans will now lose access to the doctors, the pediatricians, and perhaps even the hospitals uh, that they choose. At this point, one has to ask, what else are they hiding? You know, and while, the Amer while the White House wants to claim that healthcare.gov is now working, we know that Obamacare is still plagued with problems, and every American deserves relief from it. While well, this administration has to finally come clean and explain why and how Americans are impacted by this law. This is not something that is helping Americans. It is harming uh, those people who need help most right now. Well, welcome back. Hope you all had time with your families. Hearing from the leader about the different things that the President hid within passing this legislation. You all remember the time that it was passed late at night on a weekend moving through. By that time, there were a lot of Democrats even nervous about voting for it. So the administration put together a memo. It was in 2009. He went to his pollsters to write it, and they wrote a memo to nervous Democrats stating, when voters learn about the composition of the plan, support grows considerably. Now, the plan has been passed. The plan is now into um, a process. People are now learning more about it. Now that we found from the Gallup poll that just came out yesterday, it tells a much different story. Those who are familiar with the health care law are significantly more likely to oppose it than those who are not. So those who know about the law are more opposed to it than not. So I think it goes to answer the question from the leader, why you continue to hide things. The more America learns of this plan, the more they're opposed to it. That's why Republicans continue to fight to have a patient-driven health care system, not a government-driven health care system. All across America, working moms and dads are looking for deals so they can get something for their children that's special for the holidays. And many pa parents are trying to pick up second and even third jobs this holiday season, and they shouldn't have to. If you look at who is working and who isn't, this is the worst economy since the late 1970s. American families are struggling, 
They're struggling because of the uncertainty in Washington, the uncertainty over a broken health care law, a broken tax code, stagnant job growth, and more broken promises from this administration. Washington must start working together to bring some economic security back to American families to increase take-home pay for the hardworking families trying to make ends meet this holiday season. Thanks. We're all glad to, to be back in Washington after having had a wonderful Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving being the, the kickoff to the holiday season, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, New Year's. Uh, and it's always, you kind of picture that, that Hollywood uh, look of mom and dad sitting at the table trying to figure out what Johnny's going to get for Christmas, except this year they're sitting around the table thinking, what do we do for Christmas? because they just got their cancellation notice for their insurance, or they just got the cost of what the insurance is going to be next year. You know, the promise was accessible, affordable insurance. And affordable, now we're seeing the numbers, only 10% will have a more affordable insurance cost. So the real decisions made by real people, and they're very, very worried about it. Put on top of that the looming aspect of the personal information that's going out and not protected, your IRS information, your social security numbers, that is a very situation, a difficult situation. Anyone who's ever gone through identity theft knows it is a bad situation. The security cost and the uh, security concern, the cost increases, it hurts business, it hurts small business, businesses that they are determined for their year on holiday uh, purchases. I never advocate for the federal government to be Santa Claus, but I didn't want us to be the Grinch either. This is a very serious situation. What is a patient-driven health care system the GOP talks about, and will there be a viable GOP alternative to Obamacare in 2014, which the floor for Well, when you look at Obamacare, what you see is a government-centered health care delivery system. Well, that's not what the American people want. The American people want uh, to be able to pick their own type of health insurance. They want to be able to pick their own doctor. They want to be able to pick their own hospital. That's what a patient-centered health care system looks like. Will that be up for a vote in 2014 now, a bill for that? Speaker, will that be up for a vote in 2014? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, but to that, end, to that end, what is the, the outline of the next couple of weeks? If the farm bill and the budget bill, uh, if they don't come to agreement in the next couple of weeks, are you going to keep this year past the 13th? What's the outcome? Listen, I want the farm bill conference to be completed. Chairman uh, Lucas has, has made number of good faith efforts, we can't get Senate Democrats to the point of saying yes. We got the same problem uh, when it comes uh, to the budget conference. Chairman Ryan's done a very good job of outlining uh, very serious offers, but we can't get Senate Democrats to say yes. Uh, it, it, it is time for the other chamber to get uh, serious about getting this work finished. Mr. Speaker, this year is going down in history as the least productive in congressional history. What can you and other leaders do to change that next year? Listen, the House has continued to listen to the American people and to focus on their concerns. And whether it's the economy, whether it's jobs, or whether it's protecting the American people from Obamacare, we've done our work. But when you look at the number of bills passed by the House and the paltry number of bills passed by the Senate, uh, you can see where the problem is. Last question. Listen, the House has done uh, more than half the appropriation bills. The Senate has done none. All right? The House has done its work on the uh, National Defense Authorization Bill. We did it in June, yet the Senate uh, has failed to act. Now, the way this system of government works, both the House and Senate have to do their jobs. The House continues to do its job. It's time for the Senate to get serious about doing theirs. Republican leaders from this morning, just an update that President will be speaking about the, the latest on the health care law coming up at about 10 minutes, 2.30 Eastern. That will be live on C-SPAN 3.
and cspan.org. Three votes on the House floor. This is the first. It's a 15-minute vote dealing with water projects on the Provo River in central Utah. Well, also this morning, White House advisors briefed Democrats at their morning caucus meeting, and afterwards, caucus leadership came out to speak to reporters. We'll show you what we can as this vote continues. Javier Becerra, chairman of the Democratic Caucus, joined by our vice chairman, Joe Crowley of New York, and uh, the chair, co-chair of our steering and policy committee on the Democratic side, Rob Andrews of New Jersey. We uh, just finished a uh, welcome back to Congress meeting with our members in the Democratic Caucus, a very well attended meeting, which included a number of different subjects. Uh, we spent most of the time discussing the latest news on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, our health security law, and the progress that has been made over the last month in getting the system operating to a point where all Americans will have an opportunity to seek out and secure, in many cases for the first time, quality affordable health insurance that will forever keep them from ever having to worry about going bankrupt because they happen to have taken their son or daughter to the hospital. Uh, that's good news, and we're, we were pleased to hear the report from uh, the administration on where they've gone uh, from the major improvements on access to the website for the marketplace to the new features that allow individuals to shop before they apply so they can see what's out there, and if they like what they see, then they can go forward with the application. All of those things are good news. And because we know there is a demand out there in America for affordable health care that keeps you secure at home, knowing that you can go to your doctor or visit the hospital if necessary, uh, we know that there are members in the, the American community who are going to want to visit the website or phone call the phone number or visit the navigators, the so-called uh, assistants and the counselors who help you apply for this care. So much so that yesterday, we were told that over one million Americans logged on to the website to shop again. This is after two months of trashing of the website and two months of efforts by our colleagues on the Republican side to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. And so clearly, we know that Americans are interested in guaranteeing themselves and their family members good quality, quality affordable health care. We also know that November was a better month for applications for the health insurance policies under the marketplace than October. Not just better, but four times better. And so clearly there is an increased uh, attention to the activities on the website and an increased interest in what is offered in insurance policies through the uh, marketplace. And we hope that continues because that was the purpose of the Affordable Care Act. And so for us, it's about keeping on task. It's about continuing to build and to focus on our job. And job one for us is to make it work and to make sure that every American has access to quality, quality affordable health care. Because the real task in front of all Americans is getting America working the way it was before, putting Americans to work, getting some Americans back to work, and making sure that American business is creating all the jobs that all those Americans are hungry to apply for. And so we'd like to make sure that Congress gets to all its work, not just health care, but all its work. And while we're trying to fix it, not dismantle or shut it down, we also want Americans to know that we're going to continue to work on building the opportunities for new jobs by making sure that we're rebuilding our roads and fixing our schools and giving innovation a chance to give another entrepreneur a chance to open a new business. That's what Congress should be about. But as you can see, some of us are very concerned that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, our Republican colleagues, have focused so much attention, in fact obsessed, in killing the Affordable Care Act that they've failed to focus on the real needs of America, and that is to get Americans back to work, build our infrastructure, get the farm bill done, finally fix a broken immigration system, and deal with the budget in a way that makes sense to all Americans. We hope that 
we can get our Republican colleagues to join us on getting to work on all these issues that can be done. And we believe that every politician should be able to walk and chew gum. And we're ready to say we're not only re ready to walk and chew gum, but to make sure everybody in America has affordable health care, that we pass a uh, comprehensive immigration reform that fixes our broken immigration system, that gives people a right to work and get paid a dignified wage. We want to make sure America is working. And with that, let me yield now to our Vice Chairman, Joe Crowley. Thank you, Chairman Becerra. I think we were all very pleased this morning uh, to hear the advancements that have been made to rectify the problems with the website as it pertains to the Affordable Care Act. But let's not forget that uh, affordable care isn't just about a website. It's about providing affordable care for millions of Americans here to four who have not had that opportunity to own uh, their own insurance to cover the needs of their families. Uh, but we need to be on uh, talking about other issues as well. As my mother uh, always said, don't put off till tomorrow what you can get done today. Well, apparently my Republican colleagues didn't get that same message from their moms, or at least it didn't sink through. And as you can see here, we have a list, uh, jobs and infrastructure, uh, the 2014 budget, immigration reform, a minimum wage, uh, ENDA, uh, unemployment insurance, the farm bill, and we have the Brady background check. And there are other issues as well. Uh, this is just some of the many issues that we have yet to, uh, to, to rectify and to, uh, and to solve. And we only have eight days left before we end this legislative year. Um, all Fs. Failure to get it done. We should not settle for failure. We should be striving for success. These are not issues of the Democratic caucus. These are issues of Americans, all Americans, regardless of political persuasion. And we have a responsibility to get these done. I don't want to disappoint my mom. Mrs. Crowley will not be disappointed. I'm doing everything I can. I hope my Republican colleagues are paying attention to Mama Crowley. And because you don't want Mama Crowley mad at you. Uh, maybe listen to their mothers. Listen to uh, the people of America who want to move our Congress forward and not be labeled as the most do-nothing Congress in the history of the United States. Because that's what, they're become, that's what, that's what they will, will have become. That's not a, uh, a marker that I would like to have on my mantle place. Uh, and we as Democrats will continue to encourage, cajole, do everything we can to move an agenda forward to address these critical issues of our country. Jobs, infrastructure, immigration reform, and the list goes on. We have the ability to get this done if the Republicans who set the agenda would start moving on these issues as well. And with that, we're going to hear uh, from Rob Andrews from New Jersey. Thank you. We did take one action in the caucus this morning. We voted unanimously to buy Mrs. Crowley an Amtrak ticket. She'll be arriving at about <laughs> 1 o'clock to try to whip things into line. Um, about six weeks ago, uh, the Republicans finally realized the recklessness of their government shutdown, the harm it was doing to people, the country, and came to an agreement with uh, those of us who wanted it to end all along to end the government shutdown. The story then became the very real and difficult problems many Americans were having signing up under the Affordable Care Act. And we listened to our constituents and said to the administration, listen, you need to get to work in fixing these problems. You need to make this law work for the American people. And to the credit of the president and his team, they got to work doing that. The president uh, created a, an option for people that wanted to renew insurance policies that otherwise had been canceled. And people worked day and night around the clock for five or six weeks to try to make the situation on the website work better. We are very pleased by the news that we heard this morning, and more importantly, the feedback we're getting from our constituents in our district and districts. Um, yesterday, as you heard, over one million people visited uh, healthcare.gov and started the process of shopping for health insurance coverage. Uh, we're now up to about a million and a half people who have been declared eligible for Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, which is a significant benefit uh, for many, many people. Um, the, the, there's a technical issue, but the, the time that you wait from one page to morph into another is down now to less than a second. 
which is what you expect on eBay or what you expect on, uh, on Accenture or, or one of the other websites you would visit, uh, Expedia rather, uh, that you would expect to visit. So the administration, to its credit, has gone to work and done its job to address these very real problems. I wish I could say the same thing for the House Republicans. Because while they've spent the last six weeks assigning blame and rooting for failure, the House Democrats working with the administration have rolled up our sleeves and gone to work, and we are fixing the problems with the Affordable Care Act. Here's what the House Republicans are refusing to fix. There's a story in this morning's, uh, one of this morning's newspapers that some researchers have found a way to uh, successfully contain exploding aortas in people's hearts. Just a miraculous story about children in particular that they're, they're serving and saving lives by making this happen. It's a miracle story. The National Institute of Health helped to fund that breakthrough research saving lives of children. That budget's going to be cut by 7% in a couple of weeks if we don't do something about the sequestration. Republicans thus far have done nothing. Yesterday in the House Gallery, we had a moving experience where a number of people who love this country, who want a change in our immigration law, have dramatized the need for that change by fasting. And many of them came and brought their children to the House chamber yesterday. And we rose as one on the Democratic side to salute their patriotism, their love of our country, and their selfless pursuit of justice. There's a bill that got 68 votes in the Senate. There are many, many people on both the Democratic and Republican sides who'd like to move similar comprehensive uh, immigration reform. The Speaker refuses to put that up for a vote. There are farmers today toiling across America who don't know the rules under which they're going to be working because a farm bill has not yet been passed because of a single-minded desire by the most reckless elements of the Republican Party to take food and nutrition benefits away from the poorest and most vulnerable Americans. The administration has rolled up its sleeves. We've worked alongside them. There is still work to do, but we are fixing the problems of the Affordable Care Act. Now it is time for Speaker Boehner and the House majority to drop their complaining, roll up their sleeves, and get to work so the House can pass a budget that is balanced and fair that ends sequestration, so that we can finish our work on fixing a broken immigration system with a sensible and humane comprehensive immigration reform bill, and so that we can honor the hard work of America's farmers and America's unemployed uh, and pass uh, legislation and help them before the year is over. We've held up our end of the bargain. Now it's time for them to hold up theirs. Democratic caucus leaders, after their morning meeting, they heard at that meeting from two White House officials, David Simus, a deputy senior advisor, and Mike Hash, the head of the Office of Health Reform at the Department of HHS. The president will be talking about the health care law coming up in just a bit, and we'll have live coverage set to get underway shortly. You can follow that on C-SPAN 3 and also online at C-SPAN.org. This is the first of three votes on the House floor. It's a vote on a bill dealing with a water project on the Provo River in Utah. On this vote, the yeas are 406, the, ye the nays are zero. Zero are reported as present, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2719 as amended, on which the yeas and the nays are ordered. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2719, the bill to require the Transportation Security Administration to implement best practices and improve transparency with regard to technology acquisition programs and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote.
It's the second in a three-vote series on the House floor. These will be the last votes uh, of the day. And the House will be uh, back tomorrow. We expect special order speeches after this, uh, after this series of votes on the House floor. We also expect that we're going to see a moment of silence offered by Representative Carolyn Maloney and the New York delegation, a moment of silence for the victims of that Metro North train accident Sunday in New York City. The Associated Press reports that a union official says the engineer of that commuter train has been, quote, distraught and unable to sleep over the incident, and that's why federal investigators broke off an interview with him yesterday. The AP writes the National Transportation Safety Board says it expects to complete that interview tomorrow. Four people died and more than 60 were injured when the Metro North train came off the tracks. The NTSB saying the train was going 82 miles an hour around a 30 mile an hour curve.
difference being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1204 as amended, on which the yeas and nays are being ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1204, a bill to amend Title 49, United States Code, to direct the Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security, Transportation Security Administration, to establish an Aviation Security Advisory Committee and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. It's the last of three votes. We expect a moment of silence after this in memory of those who lost their lives in the Metro North train accident over the weekend. Earlier today, by voice vote, the House renewed the 10-year extension of the ban on plastic firearms, firearms that can evade metal detectors and x-ray machines. Also, by voice vote, the House passed a measure directing TSA to transfer unclaimed money recovered at airport security checkpoints to nonprofit organizations that operate airport centers for members of the military and their families. This is a five-minute vote just getting underway at the White House. President Obama talking about the healthcare.gov website and the implementation of the health care law. He is about to speak. You can follow it on C-SPAN 3, but while we can, we'll take you live to the White House to hear from the uh, president coming up in just a moment here. Introduce the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Monica. Well, thank, thanks to Monica, thanks to everybody uh, standing behind me, and, and thanks for uh, everybody out there who uh, cares deeply about this issue. Uh, you know, Monica's story is important uh, because for all the day to day fights here in Washington around the Affordable Care Act, uh, it's stories like hers that should remind us why we took on this reform in the first place. You know, for too long, few things left working families more vulnerable to the anxieties and insecurities of today's economy than a broken health care system. So we took up the fight because we believe that in America, nobody should have to worry about going broke just because of somebody in their family or they got sick. We believe that nobody should have to choose between putting food on their kid's table or taking them to see a doctor. We believe we're a better country than a country where we allow every day 14,000 Americans to lose their health care coverage or where every year tens of thousands of Americans died because they didn't have health care or where out-of-pocket costs drove millions of citizens into poverty in the wealthiest nation on earth. We thought we were better than that. And that's why we took this on. And uh, that's what's gotten lost uh, a little bit over the last couple of months. You know, our focus rightly had to shift towards working 24-7 to fix the website, healthcare.gov, for the new marketplaces where people can buy affordable insurance plans. And today, the website is working well for the vast majority of users. More problems may pop up, as they always do when you're launching something new. And when they do, we'll fix those too. But what we also know is that after just the first month, despite all the problems in the rollout, about half a million people across the country are poised to gain health care coverage through marketplaces and Medicaid beginning on January 1st, some for the very first time. We know that. Half a million people. And that number is increasing every day, and it is going to keep growing and growing and growing because we know that there are 41 million people out there without health insurance. And we know there are a whole bunch of folks out there who are underinsured or don't have a good deal. And we know the demand is there, and we know that the product on these marketplaces is good. 
and it provides choice and competition for people that allow them, in some cases, for the very first time to have the security that health insurance can provide. You know, the bottom line is this law is working and will work into the future. People want the financial stability of health insurance, and we're going to keep on working to fix whatever problems come up in any startup, any launch of a project this big that has an impact on one-sixth of our economy. Um, whatever comes up, we're going to just fix it because we know that the ultimate goal, the ultimate aim, is to make sure that people have basic security and the foundation for the good help that they need. Now, we may never set up President Obama speaking at the White House. Follow that live. Continue watching that live online at cspan.org and also on C-SPAN 3. The last of three votes on the House floor wrapping up. That'll do it for legislative work this afternoon. We do expect them to offer a moment of silence for the victims of the Metro North train accident over the weekend in New York City. You're watching live House coverage on C-SPAN. On this vote, the yeas are 411, the nays are 3. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider the bill is laid on the table. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues. The House will be in order. Okay. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues, tonight on Forest Lane in Cold Spring, my friend Jim Lovell won't be coming home. His children, Brooke and Jack and Finn and Hudson, the youngest, who goes to school with my little girls in Cold Spring, and who's played in my house will be missing the father they love and the beloved member of the community because he was one of the four victims on the Metro North train that derailed on Sunday. We all 
are saddened and heartbroken by this tragic event. And I stand here with my colleagues from New York to honor the four victims and the dozens of injured. New York lost a devoted father in Jim Lovell, but of course we also lost a loving sister in Donna Smith, a caring nurse from Queens named Kisuk An, and a hardworking husband from Montrose. And I know my colleagues, Nita Lowy, who represents Montrose, and Joe Crowley, who represents Queens, and Elliot Engel, who represents this, the district where the accident occurred, and I, who represents two of the victims, join with all of you in standing to offer a moment of silence in honor of those killed and of those injured. And I ask that we do so now. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield such time as she would require to my colleague, uh, Ms. Lowy from New York. The gentleman from New York, seek a separate one minute. Yes. Without objection, the gentlelady from New York is recognized. I rise to honor the memory of my constituent, James Ferrari of Montrose, New York, one of the four individuals who lost their lives in Sunday morning's tragedy. Mr. Ferrari leaves behind a wife, a 20-year-old daughter, an extended family. My thoughts and prayers are with them during this time of pain and grief. For the last 10 years, Mr. Ferrari commuted six days a week into the city to his job as a building supervisor. He was a hardworking New Yorker, totally devoted to his family. His friend and neighbor told me that he did everything for his family. And now his wife, who is still in shock, and daughter, are trying to put all the pieces of their lives together. Now Congress must do its part to honor all the crash victims by advancing solutions that prevent tragedies like this one from ever happening again. Gentlelady yields back. Oh, Mr. Speaker. This is the gentleman seek recognition. I ask for a minute to address the House and uh, uh, to uh, extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this uh, horrific uh, tragedy, unfortunately, happened in my district uh, about half a mile from where I live. Um, when a tragedy uh, like this happens, senseless tragedy, uh, we as Americans all pull together uh, wherever uh, tragedies occur, and whether it's by order, members, please take your conversations out of the chamber. The gentleman from New York is recognized, and that's what we're doing here uh, this afternoon. We're we're pulling together uh, in in the face of, of terrible, uh, terrible tragedy. I know that an investigation is going on from the National Transportation Safety Board, and I hope that in a short time we'll know what happened and perhaps we'll be able to uh, take steps uh, to ensure that it doesn't happen again, whether it be by legislation or other uh, types of ways we can, we can ensure that this doesn't happen again. My heart goes out to all the victims and their families of this senseless, senseless tragedy. And we as New Yorkers and as Americans in times of tragedy always pull together. New York pulled together after 9-11, and we're pulling together after this horrific tragedy as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields back. Does, does the gentleman seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, to address the House for one minute to revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I too want to rise to mourn the loss of these four individuals and all those who were injured in this tragic accident. In particular, I want to recognize the family of Kisuk Han of Queens. Um, the entire 
uh, Korean American community in Queens and throughout the city in the tri-state region mourn her loss. Uh, she was a, uh, a resident of my hometown of Woodside, Queens, uh, particularly want to express our sorrow on her loss and all those who lost their lives were injured once again in this tragic uh, event of Sunday. Our thoughts and prayers are with her family and all the victims and their families. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, you back. For what purpose is the gentleman from New York seek recognition? I'm just going to revise and extend this speak for one minute. With objection, the gentleman is recognized Let for one minute. Let me thank uh, Congressman Eagle, uh, Elliot Engle for the compassion which he's demonstrated for the families uh, of those that uh, survived, uh, those that are injured, and those that have been lost. Uh, while all of us are anxious to see the results of the investigation, we all have to ask ourselves, could this be avoided? And uh, did these people die in vain? And what are we going to do about it? It would appear to me that the first thing everyone thinks of is the infrastructure. Could this have happened in Japan, in, in China, or in some other industrialized country? It just stresses how important infrastructure is. And it's not just the question of looking modern and, and developing commerce. It's human lives we're talking about. Let's not those people who died and were injured die in vain. Let us all collectively look at our bridges, our roads, and our tunnels, and our airports all over our great nation so that we can avoid these types of tragedies. They yield back. The gentleman yields back. What purpose is the gentleman from New York seek recognition? To address the House for one minute and to revise and extend. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleagues for coming forward. Uh, these moving tributes. I want to add to those uh, my condolences and those of my family. Uh, this is a very resilient nation, and New Yorkers, in tough times like these, we come together. And I have, uh, every day, I have thousands of my constituents that ride these trains uh, back and forth uh, to provide for their families. And I pledge my support and those of our district as we ensure that a tragedy like this is not repeated. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair will entertain further one-minute requests. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? For one minute to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, some uh, are trying to create the impression that the only problem with Obamacare is the website, and the experts will soon fix that. Actually, the biggest problem with the so-called Affordable Care Act is that it is unaffordable. We are already having trouble paying for all the federal medical programs we have now. The costs of all our federal medical programs have been greatly underestimated.